What would a man become if he possessed a perfectly paced story? Here's a little story about how I got my PS3. I was always a Nintendo and PlayStation kid growing up. At one point, my uncle had gotten a PS3 for free, but he didn't have anyone to play it, so me and my siblings would go over to his house and play one of the two games that he had, either Heavenly Sword or the original Uncharted. Eventually, he decided to cut out the middleman and just give us the PS3, and that began my descent into endless hours of gaming, with friends, family, and randoms online. And quickly among the games that became my favorite was that action-adventure game. What's not to love? You had a charismatic cast on an Indiana Jones-esque adventure with some supernatural elements. Well, for starters, while I did enjoy the game, Uncharted Drake's Fortune is my least played of the Uncharted games. While I've played at least every other entry at least three times, I only put two playthroughs into the first game. That's primarily because it's kinda got wonky controls, it's nowhere near as bad as some other first entries in series when it comes to controls, I'm looking at you Sly Cooper and the Thievius Raccoonus, however, it's not the best. But then, in 2009, I came across a moment in gaming history that defined a generation. See, what I found endearing about playing Sony games growing up, and Uncharted specifically, is that they make you feel like the person who's being given a toast in the long-lived play Sony commercial. Then one man broke through. Michael. Michael. Michael! For all he does. For all of us. Michael. Michael! Yeah, that toasts for me. That's me they're talking about. I know it's such a goofy idea, but it's really effective. Uncharted takes you to parts of the world that few have the chance to even see. It's a game that shows us beauty beyond the screen, but puts us in a uniquely special experience in situations that can't be replicated in the real world. And yes, obviously every game has the ability to do that. But what makes those experiences stand out and hit closer to home is perfect pacing. Uncharted 2 Among Thieves is a perfectly paced game. It knows exactly how long to linger and when to move on to the next thing, and never fails to lose the audience's attention. It does this in a myriad of ways. It's hard to understate how much of a generational shift the advent of Uncharted 2 caused. Naughty Dog at the time was a relatively smaller studio that was responsible for some of your favorite childhood games. However, when it came to the seventh generation of consoles, they overhauled what was going to be another Jack and Dexter project to create the first Uncharted game. Uncharted follows the standard action-adventure formula based on movies and TV shows from the 80s while incorporating Naughty Dog's signature platforming elements into the game. Following the adventures of the self-proclaimed descendant of Sir Francis Drake, the treasure hunter Nathan Drake, the plucky journalist Elena Fisher, and the salty sea dog Victor Goddamn Sullivan set out on a journey to an Uncharted TM island to search for the gold of El Dorado. As you progress through the game, you learn more about the pieces at play and unravel the mystery of what happened to Sir Francis Drake's quest. As good as the game is story-wise, there are some issues, clunky controls, convenience for the sake of convenience, shaky pacing, which is what I really want to focus on in this video. While the first Uncharted laid the groundwork for the franchise, it only used roughly 30% of the PlayStation's hardware capabilities, so the torch would soon be passed to allow later iterations to take the series to new heights. But first we have to ask ourselves, what makes for good pacing in a story? That's a question many IP fail to understand. I can't tell you how many times excellent premises for movies, stellar actors, or interesting characters have been kneecapped by problematic pacing. Pacing is a little less subjective than some of the other more creative processes when it comes to crafting your story as a creator. I'm sure everyone's heard of the three-act narrative structure and have seen this graph of plot progression, which typically work for most stories. Some directors have a keen eye when it comes to pacing and can really stand out from the crowd like Martin Scorsese, Quentin Tarantino, and Wes Anderson, speaking just from the film industry, for example. John Steinbeck is an excellent author of classic American novels that stand the test of time, yet even when he experiments with pacing in works such as The Grapes of Wrath, in which every third chapter is an aside completely disjointed from the main story, you see what the intentions were, but where the execution fails. Pacing is a constant push and pull with the audience, as moments establish themselves, build up, speed through some sort of climactic moment, slow down, and rinse and repeat. 
Before talking about the story itself, I think we should go into a little bit of the background for the production to set the stage for this discussion. Uncharted 2 was the last time the entire Naughty Dog team was solely focused on a single game, and you can certainly tell because of the polish and cohesion of the project. As one of the two video games from Naughty Dog that won overall game of the year from the VGAs, I think it's relevant to point out what went into the production of the game that ensured them winning that at the time, prestigious award. Funnily enough, despite being lead game designer, there's very little input from Neil Druckmann in the behind the scenes video, so make of that what you will. Uncharted 2 was directed by game director Bruce Straley and creative director Amy Hennig. One of the greatest contributing factors to good pacing is good direction. Under the suggestion from Amy Hennig, Naughty Dog was fortunate enough to bring on American television director Gordon Hunt, who worked on many Hanna-Barbera productions such as The Jetsons, Scooby do, the Smurfs, and so much more. Bringing in a professional with a background in comedic timing helped to give the mocap actors better cohesion and stage presence together, as if every scene was being handled with more care than a typical game being made at the time. Gordon would return for the same role in Uncharted 3, Drake's Deception. His experience gave each interaction between the characters, whether it be dramatic, comedic, or romantic, a new weight that isn't really matched in any of the previous games that Naughty Dog had worked on, and honestly, even some of the more recent ones. Furthermore, the introduction of the Havoc game engine gave Uncharted a balance between the three core elements of gameplay, platforming, gunplay, and hand-to-hand -hand combat. It's hard to see this implemented well in the first game, but it's something that was established in Uncharted 2 and then honed to perfection in Uncharted 3. It can't be understated how important maintaining this balance is to good game pacing. Each interaction flows from one moment to the next. You'll spend a whole chapter of this game mountaineering in different platforming stunts, and then the subsequent chapters will be heart-pounding action of deadly cat and mouse chases or convoy mayhem. These pillar men of gameplay contribute to something unique in how they can uniformly mesh together. So I've talked about the behind the scenes effort that underlies its structure, but let's really get into why this game stands out so much as a perfectly paced experience. In all the times I've played Uncharted 2, the experience has lasted between 9 to 10 hours at most. The most recent playthrough I did for this video was a 100% treasure run on hard difficulty, and I'm convinced I could have done it a little faster if I didn't die so much at certain points, but forgive me, it's been a while since I played the game. But this is one of the aspects I really love about Uncharted 2. It's very consistent. There's no level that goes on for too long or overstays its welcome, specifically the chapters that take place on the train. I mean, these sections are broken up into three distinct locations, such that the player never loses interest in the events going on. Ah, I think that's our cue to talk about the story. As soon as you open up the game, Uncharted 2 greets you to a quote from Marco Polo. The plot of Uncharted 2 seems to take you on a typical action adventure, using the backdrop of his missing fleet to springboard you onto this journey. But before we can do that, we wake up bloody and broken to realize we're on a train that's about to fall off a cliff. Oh crap! This is intense. And it's already got my hands gripped to the controller like I'm holding on for dear life. Uncharted 2 immediately jumps you into the action with one of the most iconic openings from gaming history, spoon feeding you bits and pieces of information about the past as Nate slowly climbs his way out of the wreckage. Flashbacks are of a laid-back Nate encountering a former business associate, Harry Flynn, and a romantic interest, Chloe Frazier, also known as Best Girl, and they're effectively juxtaposed against the precarious situation our protagonist is in. At this point, there are so many questions going through the player's mind. What got Nate into this situation in the first place? What happened to Elena, and why is my teenage head exploding from this one scene? What is this creepy artifact that Nate picked up? And the game has every intention of delivering satisfying answers in a digestible way as it fully commits to its flashback. Nate and company are employed by a rare artifact collector to break into a Turkish museum and steal a Mongolian oil lamp. Upon finding the artifact, it contains a map to Marco Polo's lost fleet and a massive raw sapphire known as the Chintamani Stone. Nate is betrayed by Harry only to be thrown in a Turkish prison for three months. What? Face it, genius, you've been played. 
Oh, really? <gasps> hey, hey, hey! Jackass, you're ruining the show here. Ah, oh, what a shame. Sully! Time for Big Daddy Victor Sullivan to bail him out, and with the help of Chloe, who's only pretending to still be on Harry's side. This leads the game to Borneo, and the introduction of our main antagonist, Zoran Lazarevich, a Serbian military commander of a large mercenary group. He endeavors to find the lost city of Shambhala, otherwise known as Shangri-La, for unknown reasons. Nate and the gang manage to find Marco Polo's crew, who are stranded by a tsunami, but mysteriously all have black teeth and have seemed to have killed each other. With them is a map of Nepal and a golden ritual dagger. Unfortunately, Harry returns to take the map, but Nate and Sully manage to escape. However, double unfortunately, Sully isn't too keen on freezing in the mountain, so he's out of the story. And that's really the only weaker aspect of Uncharted 2. We are vitamin Sully deficient. By chapter 5, you're placed in a war-torn city in Nepal as Lazarevich's men have incited a civil war. And by this point, you're beginning to notice how much more of the world you're experiencing in this game than the previous one. That's one aspect Uncharted 2 does really well. It brings you to even more fantastical places than a lost island like in the previous game. And while here, newer game mechanics are really given time to shine, like the new run and gun features added against this truck, or the stealth actions you can perform on enemies now. And by being stealthy, you can be rewarded with more powerful weapons that can enhance your experience even further. So Nate and Chloe regroup and frankly have some of the best chemistry between any characters in the entire series for the few short chapters that it's just them together. They're such a cute couple and their dialogue rides that fine line of being wholesome yet lewd. Seems like I am always saving your ass. Well, it is an ass worth saving. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Is that an ancient Tibetan ritual dagger in your pocket? Oh, maybe I'm just happy to see you. Hmm. <sighs> yeah, hello. There's a hotel not far from here. <laughs> Chloe, now is not the time. <laughs> hey, check it out. Marco. Really? Come on. No. Marco. Polo. Fish out of water! You are so unprofessional. <clears throat> Boy, it's a shame you have to sit on something that pretty. <clears throat> she goes. Oh, I think you're liking this a bit too much. Yes! But admit it. You're gonna miss this ass. Yes! Chloe makes clear that she can not only take care of herself, but she actively complements the aspects of Nate's personality that we really haven't seen fleshed out to this degree before. After finding the temple that houses the location of Shambhala from the Hotel Shangri-La, very clever naughty dog, a high-stakes pursuit from hind helicopters ensues, which is just amazing. You're in scenes where the line between cinematic experience and gameplay begins to blur, as buildings are being blown up and things are out of control, yet you still maintain Nate's movements and actions. This leads to a seemingly awkward reunion with Elena. Sorry, I'm not. I'm sensing some history here. Oh, Elena Fisher, last year's model. Who is here for some reason because she is a journalist and she is doing investigative journalism, which is probably the most unrealistic thing from this entire game. A journalist actually doing their job. With the threat of Lazarevich's men hot on your tail, you're forced to stick together and make it to the temple. Once at the temple, you and Chloe engage in one of the coolest puzzle sequences in the entire series, realizing that your golden dagger becomes your golden passport to Shambhala. See, when it comes to puzzles, the Uncharted series has always done them pretty well. They're never really difficult or head-scratching like The Legend of Zelda. Pretty much anyone can figure these out, but they're usually used sort of as a way to accent the platforming in new and unique ways. It does always make me ask how they managed to build these things in the first place. Like who designs a locking mechanism that can be open with two of three dagger sides in it? I don't know. That's some bad engineering if you ask me. But I know the game designers are having a lot of fun going all out with these. 
After learning the location of Shambhala, it seems your luck is beginning to run out as the weather changes for the worse and Elena is overrun by mercenaries. Her cameraman is injured and you're forced to try and save them both against the better judgment of a character like Chloe. Once again, like a dog sniffing you out, Harry is right on your tail and manages to, again, steal your map and takes Chloe hostage to a train. Lazarevich comes face to face with Nate and removes the figurative shackles by executing Jeff. Oh, the cameraman's name is Jeff, by the way. He doesn't matter. He was probably stupping Elena, but who cares? Like, damn, boy, this guy is comically evil and stereotypically Yugoslavian. I love it. Even if he isn't the most fully developed antagonist, he's very reminiscent of, like, an Indiana Jones story where oftentimes the Nazis would be the bad guys. Nate and Elena manage to escape but burdened by the regret of getting Chloe captured because of his choice to save Elena, Nate now proposes to save Chloe, and Elena, with nowhere else to go, joins him, but given the circumstances of their situation, can't get on the train. You fight from the caboose, train car to train car, seemingly endless men, as the length of the train goes on forever. And yet, even though you're on this one moving platform, the sense of action never ceases. Only until it does, because you put the figurative and literal brakes on the situation by getting shot and then choosing to blow up half the train, getting us to the situation we were in at the beginning of the game. While you don't notice it right away, Uncharted 2 has one of the more interesting narrative structures. The game, time-wise, is broken into two halves, one with the flashback and one without it. But it uniquely maintains the feeling of a traditional three-act narrative structure while doing it. This is something I don't think I've seen before in storytelling, and is likely one of the reasons it stands out for not only myself, but the many other people who have played it. See, with a narrative that relies on flashbacks, usually the reveal is something that you get to maybe near the end of the story. Or sometimes, like in other Uncharted games, flashbacks are sprinkled in to give more details on a certain scenario, making scenes just that much more poignant. Or like with a game such as The Last of Us, events prior to the actual game are used at the beginning to enhance the reason for why the audience wants to see Joel and Ellie have the relationship that they do. Interestingly enough, this game has a similar structure to that of The Last of Us Part Two. However, instead of rewinding the clock at the halfway point and having the players play as a character that they hate for obvious reasons, Uncharted 2 opts to continue building off of what happened in the first half. The self-doubt Nate feels about his role, his inability to be the hero he wants to be, and the trials and tribulations he goes through to overcome that, even when characters continuously remind him that maybe everything's not what he's made it out to be. The game doesn't make the first half meaningless in a futile attempt at moral relativism by undercutting the player's time invested. It wants to commit to the immersion that the player already has and continues building off of its themes. Themes such as what it means to be a hero, the mending of broken relationships, the cost of power and immortality, and the ingenuity of the human spirit. Whoa! Oh shit, did I do that? See, when a game doesn't have contempt for its audience, it makes for an objectively more enjoyable gaming experience. But now we're in all new territory, both figuratively and literally, once again, which is why I love this game. Oh, it's so good. And while on the verge of death, Nate manages to be rescued and taken to a Tibetan village where he meets a curious Carl Schaefer, an old German looking man with a German name, a very German accent, who said he came to the area on a military expedition and probably thinks that German engineering is the best in the world. Hmm. Totally not suspicious at all, eh? But this leads me to one of my favorite sequences in the entire game, where Nate and Tenzin, his rescuer, go through an entire three chapters together without being able to communicate directly to one another. Well, aside from that one word, Nazis. Nazi? Gasp! Who could have seen this coming? What a twist! 
The entire thing is done with gestures and growing their relationship to rely on each other as they stumble upon the Nazis who were killed by Schaefer in order to stop them from getting the Chintamani stone. At this point in the game, you're beginning to realize there's more to this stone than millions of dollars. Elena even alluded to that earlier herself. This just doesn't add up, Nate. Lazarevich can't be after the money. He doesn't need it. You're missing something. And the game wants to introduce its supernatural elements here in the story with these yeti-like demon spawn that made me crap my pants when they were first revealed. Once again, this was an expertly built up reveal to these bullet sponge monsters because it starts with the warning sign at the beginning of the chapter that funnily enough has a glitch programmed into it and is followed up by the killing of the wolves and culminates in the attack on you and Tenzin. No time to waste and think about that for too long because Laser Brain is already laying waste to the Tibetan village and you engage in some of the most thrilling parts of the game as you fight a tank, regroup with Elena, and decimate an entire convoy. Even how these individual engagements are placed is really incredible because, like for the tank scene, it builds up to just finding an RPG to take out the tank. Peasant! RPG! RPG! RPG. Mixing in all three pillars of gameplay, platforming, gunplay, and hand-to-hand -hand combat into this one relentless pursuit. Same goes for the convoy scene as you're hopping from car to car until you finally can dish out something a little bit stronger. But for every moment of action, there's also moments of quiet and serenity that engage the player in the gorgeous world around them. You're not on a constant cocaine binge of non-stop bullets flying everywhere and mowing down countless enemies. You're allowed to take in the environments. And because you're allowed to explore so many different locations, you begin to notice how they contrast with each other, but still manage to promote the themes expressed through what's going on at that moment in time. At the beginning of the flashback, the color choice is vibrant and baiting us into expecting the same fun, campy adventure story from not only the previous game, but other similar stories, games, movies, novels, and television shows. A City in Ruins is quite emblematic for a character whose relationships will soon be in ruins by a tug of war between two girls who bring out different but equally gratifying aspects of Nate's personality. Chloe's still better, by the way. Nate's lowest moment in the story happens to be in a frozen wasteland for a reason. Basic things like these do wonders to a narrative's pacing. And if you don't beat your audience over the head with over-the-top symbolism, like a certain studio has been known to do recently, you can come away with so much more from a game. So the climax of the game takes place in a monastery that holds the gateway to Shambhala, and while you fight your way to save Schaefer, Nate's worst inhibitions catch up with him once again. Look, I'm very grateful for everything you've done for me. I really am, but I'm through with all this. You know, people are always telling me how lucky I am. But the truth is, everything I touch turns to shit. We're here. You are right. About what? Everything you touch does turn to shit. What's great about Uncharted 2 is its exploration of Nate's character progressing naturally through the events of the story that allows us to see the doubts that he has, and by extension, you the player are allowed to overcome them. We knew that we wanted to expand on his character to explore flaws and conflicts without losing what we thought was at the heart of our story, which is humor and charm. Yeah, good luck, pal. I mean, that's almost impossible to, oh, you did it. And you manage to solve more puzzles, unlock the gates to Shambhala, and even more secrets are beginning to be revealed. Like how the Yetis aren't actually Yetis, but are mutants with black teeth. No Chekhov's gun is left unfired in this game. And while Lazarevich has you captured, in a situation where Druckmann really wanted him to pull the trigger, you manage to escape and work your way through the ancient city to the central shrine. Now this is probably a good place to mention the progression of enemy types and the weapons you can use to dispose them. While there's no real way to enhance Nate's tools, health, or other combat attributes, like there would be in later games like The Last of Us, you the player must learn to take advantage of the available weapons in a situation to curve that difficulty spike. Mind you, this is a very gradual change, at least on hard mode difficulty it was. Enemy AI will use more body armor and come with stronger weapons further into the game, 
So by using their own weapons against them, you can come out on top. Speaking of the top, you're now at the top of the temple, and Nate, Chloe, and Elena are face to face with the Chintamani Stone, which isn't in fact a sapphire, but resin, just like the resin you've used throughout the entire game to get to this point. And you come to realize the real power lies in the sap from the Tree of Life that has the ability to heal and make individuals nearly invincible like the residents of this fallen kingdom. This is something I really like about the first three Uncharted games because they have these supernatural elements that are always more fun than not including them. Weird cursed zombie powder from the first game, a tomb that makes the water you drink send you on an acid trip in the third game. They're some of the most memorable aspects of the series. And I was really hoping for something goofy like pirate ghosts in Uncharted 4, but alas, we got a real Really cool sword fight instead. Harry has been deservedly left for dead here, only to blow himself up in a good portion of Elena too. And while Chloe and Nate manage to get her out of there, Nate realizes he must go to stop Lazarevich as best he can. Against the plea of Chloe and even his better judgment, as he's second guessing himself on the way down. And the boss fight with Lazarevich is fairly difficult because it's an actual boss fight. The first game had something brief with Navarro, the third game had a quick fist fight with Talbot, and Rafe's sword fight was honestly a close second, but none come to the intensity that this fight does. I mean, I was sweating bullets in my gamer position trying to overcome this, shooting the resin off the trees, blowing it up to him, dodging grenades, oh my god, it's crazy, all the stuff has fallen down, oh my god. And after overcoming all odds, Nate manages to do it. Lazarus Snitch tries to convince the player that you're just as evil as he is because you brutally mowed down countless men throughout this entire time you played the game. But something about that doesn't stick. Moral relativism doesn't work when you're clearly the unhinged maniac and most of the stuff I did was in self-defense a message Naughty Dog would soon go on to forget. And the game concludes with an escape from the crumbling city, Nate saving the world, reconciling his relationship with Chloe, and by proxy losing the best ass in Uncharted. Sorry, Sully. You got a great ass, Sully. Uh, thanks. Meeting back up with Sully, who makes the most based play in the entire thing, and settling with Elena. And recounting that entire experience might have brought you guys back on a sentimental walk down memory lane. But I implore all of you to go back to Uncharted 2 and give it another play. It truly is a timeless game with a lack of frustrating moments that grind the player progression to a halt or buggy gameplay mechanics. You can just sit back and immerse yourself in a story that just wants to make the player have a good time. It brings out the core aspects of why we play games in the first place. Every mechanic from before has been enhanced. The tone can swing between comedic and lighthearted fun to dramatic and intense flawlessly, while maintaining a sincerity from the developers that they just want you to enjoy the ride that you're on. And all you have to do is grab a ticket and come aboard. Amy Hennig and Bruce Straley were well aware that people will play the game in different ways. They may experience it all at once, or in chunks that could take a player several weeks to complete. So the team needed to make sure there was a balance between that disparity. The chapter structure of Uncharted 2 allows for easy access points for players to hop in and out of game. But what I really think supports this is how certain plot points are built up to. The whole build up to the reveal about the Chintamani Stone is one of the best in video game history because constant clues, whether there's subtle details like the resin or explicitly pointing out a depiction of the Tree of Life, all add to the clever way information is distilled to the audience. Uncharted 2 is the reason I will never buy another Naughty Dog video game again. I don't believe they will ever top it in quality. They've made a quality sequel in Uncharted 3. They reformed the video game narrative structure with The Last of Us. And they brought the Uncharted franchise to a solid conclusion with Uncharted 4. And while I enjoyed Lost Legacy to an extent, it didn't really scratch the same itch as the previous games in the series did. And then in my opinion, they managed to destroy it with The Last of Us Part 2. But I've already talked 
talked about that in detail. And with the advent of the Uncharted movie, I have no reason to be suspicious of its pacing at the time. I'm a little worried it's heavily reliant on iconography from the third and fourth game, but perhaps it may go down in history as one of the most miscast movies in recent memory. We'll see if Spider-Man can pull it off. But that's all I have to say about Uncharted 2. It is my second favorite game of all time for all the reasons stated in this video, and I really just wanted to share them with you. If you like the style of analysis videos, I have more coming on the way, but you can check out some of the other ones I've done here. I might review the movie on the second channel, so if I do, that'll be here too. Let me know what you think in the comments below. Hey, hey, I think I spot like a treasure on that subscribe button. You know, you gotta press it to pick up that one treasure and complete your collection. Have a beautiful day. Duang, and I'll see you all next time.